This episode of Game Show is supported by Squarespace. Share your passion with the world. Minecraft's importance cannot be overstated. The game about mining, building, and sharing has sold to the tune of 70 million copies. It led the charge of the Let's Play movement. And with Minecraft EDU, it's slowly but surely taking over the school system. As we've talked about before, it represents a paradigm shift that challenges our assumptions about games themselves. It's done all of this great stuff. But if there's one knock against it, it's that Minecraft is kind of well, ugly. However much we may love it, Minecraft is simply not winning any beauty contests. From the overworld to the nether, the game space is crudely molded out of one meter cubed blocks. Everything in this game is blocky. The chickens are cubic, the trees and clouds are boxy, the creepers are merely a couple of rectangles with a square on top. It's like the whole game was made at a box factory. But you have to admit, Minecraft totally owns its ugliness. Whether you compare it to 2D games or 3D games like Uncharted, nothing else looks quite like it. Except Minecraft clones, of course. But why are Minecraft's graphics so different from other games? Where did all these blocks come from? As it turns out, there's a really cool backstory to Minecraft's blocky world, and it begins at a pivotal junction when games were about to change forever. When I was growing up with the Genesis and Neo Geo arcade machines, most games looked the same. They were flat. And if you looked closely at the screen, you would see it was covered with a mosaic of tiny little dots. As our well-informed game show audience probably already knows, these were called pixels. Don't get that confused with that terrible Adam Sandler movie that's called Pixels but actually uses 3D. In fact, let's just forget that movie entirely. Pixels can be traced all the way back to 1957 when Russell Kirsch, a young engineer at the National Bureau of Standards and a proud father, scanned an image of his three-month-old son. Don't you just want to pinch his pixelated little cheeks? But pixels were not the only way of doing graphics. As they say, there is more than one way to skin a Bubsy. In 1972, at the University of Utah, two students named Fred Park and Ed Catmull invented 3D graphics using polygons. Incidentally, Catmull later founded and became president of Pixar. They created a demo with the riveting title, A Computer Animated Hand, which caused a stir when it appeared in Future World a few years later. And while they are both used to create computer art, pixels and polygons work in completely different ways. With pixels, the artist starts with a grid called a bitmap and colors in the cells to form a flat image. It's the same idea you see in cross-stitching, so see, you and your grandmother do have something to talk about. But with polygons, the artist starts by drawing three points called vertices. Three vertices create a triangle. This is the simplest polygon, and when multiple triangles are combined on the screen, they can form a 3D image or model. However, polygons weren't ready for prime time because computers were slow and clunky and not ready to truly do them service. So for the meantime, games stuck with pixels and everything was hunky-dory. We had these wonderful pixel games to play. That is, until the mid-90s when the polygon returned like the prodigal son. Everyone was excited for Star Fox and Toy Story and Virtual Worlds, but Pixels were not too keen on that. They were all like, oh yeah? Our cousin can do 3D too. Meet the voxel. Voxels have been invented in the 1970s, but have been lying around in the broom closet of graphic technology and only brought out to do important but kind of unexciting work like cat scan imagery. And voxels are a lot like pixels. In fact, voxel is shorthand for volumetric pixel. The main difference being that a pixel is square while a voxel is cubed. At least most of the time they are cubes because that's the simplest building block. And just like pixels are placed together on a grid to create a flat image like this adorable pixel art of Kirby, many voxels are placed together to create a 3D object, like your house in Minecraft. Since voxels are pretty much pixels in 3D, they seem like the most logical choice for doing games in 3D. So what happened to voxels? Why did polygons take over? As you probably already realize, polygons were to go on to be a big triumph. 
While the lowly Voxel would be all but wiped off the map, Voxels really didn't even put up much of a fight. It was much less Foreman versus Ali and more Rousey versus Correa. In fact, the Voxels flopped so hard that it's difficult to locate good footage of the few games that used them back in the day, like Amok and Comanche Maximum Overkill. Many factors went into their demise, but a big reason is that Voxels were uneconomical. For instance, if an artist wants to draw a pyramid in polygons, they could simply place a few great big triangles in the distance. But the voxel artist would have to build each pyramid out of many small blocks. So your computer was doing more work for the same result. Only blockier. By the turn of the century, everyone had forgotten voxels. Well, except for one guy, Ken Silverman. Silverman was a child prodigy who made a Wolfenstein 3D clone called Ken's Labyrinth when he was only 16. Epic Games was so impressed by his talent that they bought the rights from his father. One day, while looking through the second edition of Computer Graphics, Principles and Practice as One Does, young Silverman came across an illustration of voxels. He was smitten. By the time he turned 20, he had developed the engine for Duke Nukem 3D. In fact, he tried to use voxels for it, but they were deemed unnecessary. Then Silverman decided to retire from the WizKid game programmer gig and, you know, go to college like other people his age. But he never gave up on voxels. Ken became convinced of voxels' superiority. He thought that polygons would transition into voxels. Someday, Voxels will rule the world, he blogged. This sounds weird because polygons seem like the better option. But if voxels were shrunken down to be tiny, they could build objects with a level of precision and detail that polygons could only dream of. The only problem with shrinking voxels down to the size of grains of sand is that computers aren't powerful enough to handle it. So after college, Silverman took it upon himself to save voxels. He spent several years developing an engine called Voxlab that would optimize voxels. But alas, the voxel proved too much and he abandoned the project, telling us he got tired of hearing people complain about the world looking too blocky. And though he didn't convince the world, at least a few people were paying attention. This included Dan Hathaway, who built the block engine for Infinifrag. Long story short, Infinifrag became Infiniminer, and when Infiniminer's source code leaked on the internet, Notch used it to make, drum roll please, Minecraft. Minecraft wouldn't be Minecraft without voxels. Voxels are not just used because they're kitschy or retro or look cool, but because they let you play in a completely different way. Take digging, for instance. To go back to our pyramid example, there's no way you could dig through the pyramids in Mario 64 because they're large, flat polygons. Nothing's underneath it. But Minecraft's graphics are structurally different. The world is made of voxels, which are stacked together like building blocks. So that means you can burrow through the walls and the ground and stake your claim in it. So Ken Silverman was right. Voxels are pretty spectacular, just a little misunderstood. So the voxel lost, but it hung on by a thread and influenced the biggest game of this century, maybe one of the biggest of all time. It's poetic justice or computer art justice or I don't know, some kind of justice. What do you think? What are your favorite games that you like for their graphics, be it pixels, polygons, voxels, or something else? And do they do something innovative with them? Game Show is supported by Squarespace. If you have a passion that you obsess over, if it keeps you up at night, if you live for it, you should show it off. With tools and templates, Squarespace helps you showcase every detail of what drives you. They also offer domains, hosting, and customer support. Because if it's worth the effort, it's worth showing the world. Start your trial today. Visit squarespace.com forward slash game show. Also, if you like what you saw, please subscribe. I'll see you next week. Hey everybody. So last week we talked about how Mario's power-ups changed everything. Let's see what you had to say. Isaiah Games says that the best power-ups in platformers are the ones that change your mobility. Isaiah Games also thinks that abilities like the Tanuki suit, one of my personal favorites, the cape from Mario World, and riding on Yoshi's back are some of the most fun. And this is not merely a matter of personal preference. Uh, in fact, according to game designer Ralph Coster, who we've cited many times in the show, and again cited him on last week's episode, being able to use different abilities is one of his six principles of game design. So go ahead and Google Ralph Coster 
Master, Fundamentals of Game Design for more information on that. But um, being able to use different abilities not only applies to attacking enemies as it was discussed last week, but also accounts for having multiple ways to move through the level itself, which what uh, the so-called traversal power-ups in later Mario games give you the ability to do. Again, like the Tinky Suit, it allows you to fly, go to different places. In fact, even the first Super Mario Brothers has a little bit of this element in it. If you think about your options for level one, you could actually go down into the warp pipe or climb up to the bonus stage or play straight through the level. Uh, those of you who are old enough to remember Nintendo Power, they actually featured these kind of grids that would show you sort of the layout of the game itself so you could see exactly what your options were. Jason Garden brings up an excellent point that games like Ghosts and Goblins um, are the exact opposite of this very Mario idea that a game should give you multiple ways to play through as I just alluded to. Uh, as you probably know, or if you don't, Ghosts and Goblins is a very, very hard game where the player is pump up, totally punished unless they play the game exactly how the designer wants them to play. Um, these, are, uh, these are called Massacore games, you might have heard that term thrown around before. Um, it was likely coined by game designer Anna Anthropy, or at least that's the first person I ever heard use that term. In any case, Anthropy uh, traces the origins of the massacre genre back to Mario, um, only not just Mario 1, but the super hard Japanese Mario, uh, Mario 2. In fact, she says that Mario 1 and 2 do something unique where the first game sets up your expectations and the second one then violates them by doing something totally unexpected. Um, so in the second game, for example, you're given a warp pipe that takes you back to the beginning of the game. It just goes to show you that Mario has done it all. Thank <laughs> you.